Okay. So um, you can look through learning objectives. Um, this beginning part, so this is two parts, basically. We'll probably have lunch in between the two parts. The first part is immune system. How the immune system works is something that I'm going to really let you review on your own time. Um, and then we're going to talk about what happens when it doesn't work so much, three specific diseases. And then, um, so the first thing we need to talk about, why you even have an immune system, is what is infection. And so a lot of nursing, if you haven't figured out already, is vocabulary. You are learning a new language, so I need to make sure that you know the vocabulary of our new language so that you can use this language, um, you know, as you see it. So um, infection, you need an immune system because there are pathogens in the world. Pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease, and these are the three most common pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and fungi. This should be something you all know a lot about because you live in the world. So you can get infection from bacteria, you can get infection from viruses, you can get infection from fungi or yeast or um, protozoas, but you can, those are the three most common. If you hear the word healthcare-associated pneumonia, it used to be called nosocomial, but healthcare-associated uh, healthcare -associated infections, or HAIs, they are found mostly in the hospital setting, and you don't go into the hospital with these infections. You get them in the hospital. And hospitals are supposed to be places where we go to heal, not get infections. So these are pretty much never events as far as a hospital is concerned. Um, so if you see these words, you're not going to get tested on these words, but I want you to be familiar with these words because as you go out in the community and in the clinical, you will see these words because they're very important to the hospitals. Um, if you have a catheter and you get a urinary tract infection, it's considered a hospital-acquired infection. If you have a central line and you get an infection, it's a hospital-acquired infection. And if you get an infection on your surgical site, you wouldn't get those normally wandering around. You don't usually have urinary catheters or central lines or surgical sites wandering around the community. So those are hospital-acquired. Um, and most of them are preventable. And how do you think they're preventable? Washing, Washing your hands. Washing your hands is the most effective way to prevent hospital acquired um, infections. And they find that, um, how many people do you see carrying their stethoscope around on their neck? Everybody carries their stethoscope around on their neck, right? Yeah. No, you're not supposed to, because think about it, you're in a room with your patient and you flip off and you listen to them and you put it around your neck and you go into the next room and you flip it off your neck and you listen to them. Did you wash it in between? Most people don't. If you do, great, that's perfectly fine. It's not the having it around your neck that's the bad, it's the using it in between patients. So not only, you know, so you're washing your hands, you're doing all this good stuff, but there is bacteria on that stethoscope from your neck, from your hair, from you know, walking around, from touching another patient, and then they go use it. So they find that ties on doctors, um, lab coats, uh, you know, stethoscopes, things that we take room to room also are transmissions of hospital-acquired infections. So just to kind of be aware of whenever you go into the room, make sure that you've either sanitized or cleaned or, you know, whatever, because we are 100% responsible for transmitting hospital-acquired infections. All right, so I'm going to, um, in the, do you guys like to watch videos in class or no? Kind of, got half and half. Um, what I'm going to do is let you watch this on your own time. This is, um, in addition to the crash course that I put on the thing, this is basically how the immune system works and why we have an immune system. Um, let me see how long it is. Let's decide if we're going to watch it. If it's less than 10 minutes, we'll watch it. But, oh, it's six minutes. It made it. Okay. <laughs> Wait, if you pause it. Just pause it and play it again? And then it's when the bass gets too loud. Oh, really? Yeah. You have to turn the bass down. Oh, my. I'll try it. So the body doesn't waste energy or hurt itself. But what is produced by the B cells? You've heard of them, of course. Antibodies. Little proteins that are engineered to bind to the surface of the specific intruder. There are even different kinds of antibodies that have slightly different jobs. The help of T cells tell the plasma cells which type is needed the most in this particular invasion. Millions of them flood the blood and saturate the body. 
Meanwhile, at the site of infection, the situation is getting dire. The intruders have multiplied in number and start hurting the body. Guard and attack cells fight hard, but also die in the process. Help and T cells support them by ordering them to be more aggressive and to stay alive longer. But without help, they can't overwhelm the bacteria. But now the second line of defense arrives. Millions of antibodies flood the battlefield and disable lots of the intruders, rendering them helpless or killing them in the process. They also stun the bacteria and make them an easy target. Their back is built to connect to killer cells, so they can connect and kill the enemy more easily. Macrophages are especially good at gnoming up the bacteria which antibodies have attached to. Now, the balance shifts. In a team effort, the infection is wiped out. At this point, millions of body cells have already died. No big deal, the losses are quickly replenished. Most immune cells are now useless, and without the constant signals, they commit suicide, so as not to waste any resources. But some stay behind, the memory cells. If this enemy is encountered ever again in the future, they will be ready for it, and probably kill it before you even notice. This was a very, very simplified explanation of parts of the immune system at work. Can you imagine how complex this system is? Even at this level, when we ignore so many players and all the chemistry. Life is awfully complicated, but if we take the time to understand it, we always encounter endless wonders and great beauty. Okay, so that was just a quick recap of the immune system. Very quick recap. Um, so I will not, again, that was from anatomy and physiology so that you can understand the pieces that we're about to give you. So uh, this is just, again, to go along with the video, there's a first line defense and a second line defense. Um, we're going to talk about the first line defense for a little bit, which is the inflammation response. And then we will talk about the second line defense only in terms of when it goes bad and some problems with it. Um, so the first line defense is inflammation. Remember they said at the very beginning, when something gets in there, there's nonspecific cells that go to the site to start killing it right away. And then they call in fluid and things out of the bloodstream. So that first fight before all those other fancy things get involved, like memory cells and T cells. This is what causes inflammation, okay? So what they're doing is that those first little cells that get to the site and start eating up bacteria release histamine and something called complement. That's the, the messenger protein they were talking about that sends off for more help. So the response of histamine and complement is to make your vessels leaky so that those big proteins can get out of your blood vessels to the infection site. It calls a cellular response and it moves fluid and things to the infection site, right? So as soon as you get scratched, you're going to start leaking around that site. Hopefully the body keeps it contained to just that site. So like you said, if you cut your finger with a rusty nail, it swells because this is what's happening at that site. Um, why does it get hot and red? Hmm? Well, heat kills bacteria, but why does it get hot and red? Why do you feel heat and redness? But what about the inflammatory response makes it hot and red? All your blood's going to that swelling site. So it's all blood, and blood carries heat with it. Um, so that vasodilation causes swelling, redness, and heat. So that's why it is a sign and symptom of infection. It's something that we can see. Swelling, redness, heat, inflammatory response. Okay? So this is just another picture. Like I said, for people who are visual, I'm very visual. I need to see a picture or I don't understand it. So this is still another picture of um, what's happening at the site there. Uh, hopefully, your body kills off everything locally. So you can have an acute inflammation, which means that it's going there. It's it's fighting the bacteria, killing off the bacteria, and then subsides. So you get a hangnail that gets infected, it swells, it hurts for a couple of days, maybe up to a week, and then as it clears the infection, it starts to get better. So the most of our inflammation is acute inflammation. Um, Subacute inflammation is where something is still stimulating the response. They can't kill off all the infection at once, so the, the inflammation sticks around for a while. And chronic inflammation, 
for some reason we can't kill off all of the invader response or we can't kill off something and you basically have an inflammatory response all the time. So those are just vocabulary. If you cannot get this under control locally in a certain amount of time, those messenger proteins send off signal and you start having systemic inflammation. This means you have a big infection that needs more help. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but those chemical signals then go up to the brain, to the hypothalamus, to say, we've got a local situation that is not under control, we need backup from the whole body, and that will cause a fever, okay? So when local inflammation gets too big to control locally, then you start getting a fever. Um, so this is kind of what the video is showing, how it, um, how it turns from a local inflammation to a systemic inflammation. These are just vocabulary words that I want you to know because we will probably be talking about them later on. Antigens are, remember when they said that one cell eats it up and presents it on the outside? Antigens are just broken pieces of bacteria or virus or whatever, the fungus or whatever's in there that that cell broke up and put it on its membrane to identify what the intruder is. Okay, so an antigen is a piece of the intruder bacteria or virus. Um, and then it activates a helper T cell. And then we go into that whole immune cascade, which we're really not going to talk in detail about. But this is what recruits the second line of defense. And that helper T cell was the one that was telling the other cells, don't die, not yet. Those are the helper T cells. And we will talk about helper T cells in another uh, disease process. But those are the activated helper T cells, are the ones that look at the antigens and then go out and get the rest of the help. The complement system and prostaglandins are the chemical messengers that are released by bacteria. And if enough of them build up in the system, they end up in the hypothalamus and cause a fever response. Okay? So this is what a fever looks like. This is your signs and symptoms of systemic. So what's your signs and symptoms of local inflammation? Redness, swelling, pain, heat, that's all local inflammation. You can have both, but there's a signs and symptoms of systemic inflammation. So what you think of as a big infection, right? You get an increased white blood cell count. Why? We got to have more, right? So your white blood cells are multiplying, and it doesn't matter if you know which ones. Your white blood cell counts are getting bigger because they're going off to fight an infection, they're being recruited by those activated helper T cells, they are starting to multiply. Why you get tired? Your putty is busy, it's fighting a war in there. It's busy, it wants to rest. It's trying to tell the rest of the body, you know, just, just calm down. I got a whole lot of going on here, let me, let me rest. Nausea, anorexia. If you're sick, why do you not feel well? Why do you not want to eat? What's it? There'd be a lot of toxins being released for one. It could be the toxins. Um, it takes a lot of energy to digest food. So your food and your digestion is usually the first part that gets shut down if your body's under stress. Okay? Unless you're a comfort eater, which I am. But usually if the body realizes it's under stress, it's going to shut down the GI system and make you not interested in eating because it doesn't have time. It doesn't have time for that. It could be a response to toxins as well, but usually it's just like, hey, nobody got time for that, okay? I'm not even gonna fuss with food right now. Um, increased pulse and respiratory rate. What do we need to do that for? You gotta get everything faster. There's a war zone going on somewhere in your finger, in your stomach, or in wherever this infection is. It needs blood because there are more red blood, uh, more red blood cells, more white blood cells, more things getting to that site. And you need oxygen. So you're going to breathe faster, and your heart's going to be a little harder to get all that to that site, okay? And the fever, heat kills bacteria. So your body's producing a fever to kill bacteria, okay? So those are what your systemic response looks like. So why do you get a fever? To cook those little guys, okay? Remember, our body likes a certain temperature, right? What's our normal temperature? 98.6, that's where our body likes to live. We can go a couple in either direction without any trouble. Bacteria are the same way. If bacteria get overheated, they will die. And if bacteria get too cold, 
they will die. That's why you put them in the refrigerator or they can't replicate. That's why you put things in the fridge and the freezer because if they're too cold, they can't replicate. And if they're too hot, they will get killed. So we're basically boiling bacteria in our body. Hopefully not boiling all the rest of our cells too. But um, it also increases our cellular metabolism. So of course, if you make things hot, things speed up. Okay, so it helps the immune response get there faster and it helps things heal. So fever is actually something we don't really want to block all the time. It has a purpose. We like its purpose unless it starts getting to be symptomatic. Um, but what is the definition of fever? Body temperature greater than 100.5. So like 99, we call low-grade fever. It's information, but we don't treat. Okay, We don't even really worry about it until it gets over 100. Do you do that with your kids? I used to send my kids to school with 99. I'm like, yeah, that's not even a fever. That's just, hey, let me know you got an infection. That's just information. It's not really something I have to act on. Um, you will increase your respiratory rate because, of course, you're trying to get oxygen. You're going to increase your heart rate because you're trying to get blood to that spot. And you're going to get an unstable blood pressure, maybe. Why would that be? If you were having a big response all over your body, why would you have a bad blood pressure? vasodilation because remember your cells got leaky so if it's just leaky here in your finger you're just going to have your fingers swell if your whole body if it's sending out a signal to your whole body to have all your capillaries leak well you're going to lose a lot of fluid into your tissue space and you will lose it out of your bloodstream and so your blood pressure will drop a little bit so that's why you feel a little woozy when you have a fever so when you stand up fast after you've been in bed and you've got a fever and you sit up and you feel like you're going to pass out, it's because you've probably lost a, blood, a lot of blood volume into your tissues because of this leakiness, and you are a little bit orthostatic. You have lost a little bit of your blood pressure. So um, you may have an unstable blood pressure depending on how high that fever is and how much leaking you're doing. Why do we have vasodilation? Why do we raise our temperature? Or how do we raise our temperature? So how does this fever work? How do we raise our temperature? How does our body do that? The hypothalamus. So those prostaglandins, those chemical messengers, get up to the hypothalamus, and they tell the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus sends out signals. What do those signals tell the body to do? So you can shiver. So basically you have to gain energy, okay? You have to make your body hot. How do you make your body hot if it's not hot in the room? Activity. Increase muscular activity. So shivering and doing this will increase your temperature. Okay? So if you shiver, you will increase your temperature because your muscles are generating energy and generating heat. Um, so we were just talking about how it makes the capillaries leaky. That's local response. Local response is making them leaky. But the prostaglandins in that response coming from the hypothalamus are telling your core body temperature or core temperature to constrict. So if you go out in the heat, do you get flushed or do you get pale? You get flushed because what are you trying to do? You're trying to release the heat out of your body. So what do you think you are going to do if you are trying to keep heat in your body? You're going to vasoconstrict. So there's mixed messages going on to the body during a fever. The, the brain is telling the body, clamp down, retain heat, okay? So guess what, you, do you get pale or flushed? You get pale. When you are spiking a fever, you get pale because the body is closing down the blood system trying to retain the heat in the body. So why do you get chills? Your body's trying to heat up. So you're shaking and you're pale because your body is trying to close down to retain heat and you're shaking to generate heat. You're basically a heat generator right now. You're trying to mount the um, temperature. And then, of course, you get goosebumps. Why do you get goosebumps? So you, don't lose heat through your skin. so you don't lose heat through your skin. That's just like if we had fur and you mounted your fur. You're just basically trying all the things that you would do if you were out in the cold trying to retain heat. Okay? If you're out in the cold trying to retain heat, you're going to get paler. You're going to get goosebumpy. You're going to be shivering. All the things that we do to retain heat when we're in the cold, this is normal temperature and you're doing this because your body's trying to keep heat. So you start spiking a fever. 
So you start getting up to 100, 101, 102. Well, now there's a signal in the brain saying, whoa, you're going too high. Now we need to, we need to, oh, you, you're retaining heat. You're retaining heat a little bit too much. So now we're going to send out and you're going to vasodilate. So you can see the process of mounting a fever is gaining heat, letting some of it out. Gaining heat, letting some of it out. Okay? We want to not get above really 102. Our body will start to die off if we get too hot. So we really want to keep it right around 102, 103 is our good quality fever that will kill bacteria without harming the body. Once you start getting above that, it starts getting dangerous to the body. So the body is supposed to do this temperature lowering as well to keep the fever in that high range, but not too high. Okay, so how do we get rid of heat? We sweat, we flush, we, um, you get red. So that's why when you're getting a fever, and so think about the last time you maybe had the flu or a really bad infection, and you were shivering and cold, shivering and cold, and then you were hot. And you were shivering and cold, shivering and cold, and then you were hot. That's your body regulating itself so that it doesn't get too hot, but it, it wants a fever. Okay? So you, this is all natural and normal and good. Um, in little kids, they don't have as good response. They can mount a fever, but they can't get rid of it as well. They're not as responsive as we are as adults. That's why kids get higher fevers. They can't cool as well as we can. But that's why when you're laying in bed feeling sick, you're getting hot, you're getting cold, you're getting hot, you're getting cold, but your body's just trying to keep it right there. It knows it wants a fever, but it wants to keep it right around that 100, 203, which is why as adults, we don't usually get too high because we should be, if we're not sick, really good at managing our temperature. And that's what our brain is doing for us. Um, you get headache and you get achy because of what the prostaglandins are doing. Um, they sensitize pain receptors that would normally be painless. So like the edge of your skin, where you feel like, oh my God, my skin is gonna crawl off. I am so sore. That's just the effect of prostaglandins. Um, they do help vasodilate and vasoconstrict. <laughs> and they are in charge of kind of getting that signal back out to the body. So those prostaglandins are just messengers, but you can see they kind of give you a headache and pain as well, but they are normal and natural. So that's why when you have a fever, so think back to when you've had the flu and you can feel what it's like to have a fever. So you can imagine any patient that has a fever doesn't feel very well because the fever takes a lot out on a body. So what do we do for someone with a fever? Well, you've done this all, this is not new knowledge. You've done this if you have a kid or a sibling or yourself who have ever been sick. Make sure they don't get sicker. They've already got enough trouble going on. Wash your hands. We're going to monitor their temperature and their blood pressure because a fever is good. We just don't want it getting too high. Okay? So you're going to monitor their temperature to see if it's starting to get too high. If it's starting to get too high, we may need to help if the body is not doing a good job of keeping it regulated right around that 102 part. But, um, so we're going to keep an eye on their temperature. Why would we keep an eye on their blood pressure? Because it's constantly changing. It's constantly changing. You're vasodilating, you're vasoconstricting, you're losing fluid. Because when it does dilate, you lose fluid. When it constricts, you keep fluid. Your, your blood pressure is fluctuating. You need to keep an eye on the blood pressure of a patient that has a fever, especially if they were sick to begin with. Why do you need fluids? You're getting dehydrated. Whenever it vasodilates and you're leaking, that's the stuff that's leaving your bloodstream not to be replaced for a little while until the system, until this infection's gone. So you need more fluids. Water also helps you regulate your body temperature. It helps that process. So if you get dehydrated, that cooling down process doesn't work. So if you're dehydrated and you have a fever, you don't cool down very well. So then your fever mounts higher and higher and higher. If you keep yourself hydrated, that cooling down process works and you can keep your fever regulated. Um, why are we monitoring their skin color and temperature? You're seeing, I mean, if they go pale and start shivering, guess what's happening? They're probably about to spike a fever or in the process of spiking a fever. If they are way vasodilated and they had a fever and now all of a sudden they're sweating and red, you might want to recheck their temperature. Maybe things are coming down. Um, they do need a lot of calories. Of course, we talked about when you have a fever, you don't want to eat, but this is the feed of fever. There's a lot going on in your body. Your body is mounting energy. It requires a lot of energy. It's making heat. It requires a lot of energy, so they need more food. You need more food if you have a fever. Um, you don't feel like eating it, but you need it. So high-protein things, um, if you can, something with good calories. 
This would not be the time to eat a salad. This would be the time to have the milkshake because your body needs it, needs the extra stuff. Um, and then we will give fever-reducing stuff, but only if the temperature gets too high, okay? Remember, we're going to let the body do what it needs to do. It's a healthy response. But if the temperature starts getting too high and we look like we can't manage, it's not going to cool itself down very well, then we will give something to help it cool down. And what do we give? Hey, you've probably given all of these things. Aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen. All right? Um, depending on what the patient can take and what they're like and, you know, what the rest of their organs look like. Aspirin, Tylenol, and non-steroidals, non um, anti-inflammatories like naproxen, ibuprofen, all of those um, block prostaglandins. So it will make you feel better because that pain stimulus is going away. It will um, block the prostaglandins from increasing the temperature anymore, so your temperature goes down. Um, and so that's all they do is they block that prostaglandin, that chemical messenger, so you don't end up with that fever. So as soon as these wear off, the prostaglandins are back doing what they're doing. So um, you're going to give aspirin, Tylenol, and non-steroidals, but because your body's already working really hard and your liver's working hard and your kidneys are working hard, we don't want to overload them with medicines unless we have to. So generally, in acute inpatient, we let fevers kind of go, okay? 101, 5, 102, there's usually an order. Fever, and it usually says somewhere in there what temperature you give the aspirin. We're not going to go ahead and as soon as they're 101, give something. It depends on what's going on with the patient. Now, if they are mounting a fever and they just can't stand the pain or whatever, sure, give it to them. But usually we let the fever do what it's going to do because it's going to help boil the bugs and increase the healing in the cells. So we want a little bit of a fever. It's okay. So just think, keep that in mind. As soon as you see a temp of 101 or 100.8, you're not automatically going to go right to drugs because we don't want to overload. A lot of these patients are sick and probably have a lot of drugs on board. We don't want to add more drugs to them unless they're really necessary. So um, usually we wait till about 102 around there um, before we give them. But again, if the doctor's order says 101.5, Sure, give it then. Or if the patient is extremely uncomfortable with their fever, then you can give them their non-steroidals or their aspirins. So we're going to talk a little bit real quick. So we talked about what we would do for fever. We're going to talk really quick what we're going to do for infections. So you can see over here that viruses get antivirals, bacteria get antibacterials, and fungus get antifungals. Wow. wow. Yeah. Hey, you got it. You're on. You sold. So anti-infectives are narrow or broad spectrum. Narrow means they're only good about specific things. Broad spectrum means they kill a lot of things. Okay, so whenever you get an infection, you usually get on a broad spectrum until they find out what it is, and then they kind of adjust it from there. Um, PO versus IV determines how bad. This is just basically to help the immune system. Okay, this is a drug that will kill the bacteria along with your body. So it is just an extra thing to help the immune system out. Maybe your immune system doesn't work that well. Maybe it's too big of an infection for your immune system to kill off on its own. These will go in there and kill bacteria and let your immune system mop it up. Um, so you can, you know, that's just, I'm going to let you read all that. But the things that you need to know are what do you do if your patient is on an antibiotic? Well, make sure they get it on schedule. If it's ordered every eight hours, give it every eight hours. Um, if they are getting an IV or I get with any antibiotic, watch for sensitivity reactions. Okay, antibiotics are high high risk for um, allergic reactions, and we'll talk a little more about those in a minute. Um, and the other thing I'm going to point out is that we need to know what bug we're fighting. Okay, so if you give an antibiotic and then culture for the bug. <laughs> Well, it probably kills the bug. We will never know what we fought. So you can give the antibiotics, but make sure you culture whatever it is. So if you need to get a sputum specimen or a wound culture or blood cultures, get those before starting an antibiotic if you can. Because if they think there's an infection and they don't know what it is, they're going to want to know, they're going to collect fluids from a bunch of different places to find out what the infection is. And if you give two or three doses of an antibiotic before getting your specimens, well, then there's no bacteria to grow out. It looks like they never had an infection to begin with. So that's why they always, you know, when you go into urgent care, 
they will get your flu swab or your cultures, culture your throat to do those things before they give you antibiotics. We've got to know what bug we were fighting to begin with to know if there needs to be adjustments. Um, keep an eye on their temperature, pulse, and respiration. One, you're going to make sure that their fever gets better. Two, you're going to make sure they're not having any kind of reaction. Um, you're going to watch to make sure why what, white blood cultures. What are you going to look for in your white blood cell count if you're on antibiotics? If it's increasing, what's happening? Infection. The infection's getting out of control. It's not working. If you've been on antibiotics, what should your white blood cell count do? It should drop because the antibiotics are supposed to be killing the bacteria, so your white blood cells aren't as necessary. Um, and then, of course, watch for adverse reactions. They're pretty high risk. And then you can teach the family. These work for any antibiotics. So any antibiotics you look up, it has the same teaching. Okay. So I will. Lay, that's in every drug book and everything. But patient teaching is very important on antibiotics. And then this is just a piece. Um, just on familiar answers, what emerging infections are. You can see these are things that the hospitals are worried about and things that are contagious and new. Those usually get reported um, out to the CDC and also they have special precautions. So you know about all the different precautions, right? You've heard about contact precautions, droplet precautions, airborne precautions. Those are to keep these infections under control and from getting spread around. It's just kind of an information slide. So, let's stop, and part of my job is to teach you to think like a nurse, okay? Not just to give you information. I want you to take that information and think. So, you have a patient that has cellulitis of the right foot. They have diabetes. What's CAD? Coronary artery, Coronary artery disease, cataracts, and hypertension, okay? There's their orders. There's their vital signs. What do you, what's your priority for this patient? So let's type in some stuff. So what is your priority for this patient? What, just call out some things. What do you want to do for this patient? What's that? All right. Oh, so we're going to say fluids. Sorry, I don't have very good handwriting. Um, I don't have that information, so I guess we'd have to get it. So what other things do you want to do? So based on, think about your interventions. What's your priority out of all these things? What's your priority for this patient? Well, they're on the <laughs> Well, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't say whether they've gotten the dose. They came in this morning and they have an order. So yes, you would make sure that they get their antibiotics. So your first priority is give them their antibiotics, okay? If they've already had a dose then make sure your next dose is timed appropriately from the first dose. If they haven't had their dose, what are you going to do before you give their dose? Culture. Make sure that it's cultured. If it's cellulitis of the foot, if they have any drainage or anything, check your orders. Do you see an order for culture? No. I don't see one. See if they need to have an order. So cellulitis may not have any drainage. There may not be anything to culture. But see if there are any orders for culture because before you give an antibiotic, you want to make sure there's no cultures. So we're going to make sure that the um, that cultures, and CX is short for cultures. So we're going to make sure the cultures are done. So we're going to make sure cultures are done if they're applicable. We're going to give them their antibiotics. You got their vitals. So your priority, you decided to give them antibiotics. You have to monitor in case they have an allergic reaction. Okay. So after we give the antibiotics, we can monitor for allergic Why are we worried about their glucose? Oops. Wow, you guys are like ahead of things. I haven't even gotten there yet. Let me see how I go back. There we go. Monitor for allergy. All right. So we're going to give them their antibiotics. So basically, what, what's wrong with this patient right now? They have a systemic infection. They have cellulitis. And why is it systemic? Look at your heart rate. It's increased. Your temp is increased. Is our blood pressure unstable? It doesn't tell you what your respiratory rate is, but let's say our respiratory rate is 30. And, yeah, he has hypertension. That's a good call. 
That's a good call. He's hypertensive. He's either controlled with his medication or he's a little low because most people that are getting hypertensive meds, they're kind of up in the 140s or 160s. So a blood pressure of 108, that might be a little bit low. We don't know. So yes, my priorities for him are to give the antibiotics and to monitor him. I don't know him that well. I need to get to know him. So I'm going to do more vital signs, right? I want to see what's happening with this guy. So we're going to monitor vital signs and temp just to see where we're going, OK? Um, so we're going to give him his antibiotics. We're going to culture if necessary. We're going to monitor his vital signs and temperature. Will that take care of everything? I mean, are we good? We just want to make sure you have the orders for controlling if he has like a blood sugar spike. Okay, so you guys, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna probably put that down on the list because that would be yes, he that is certainly important. It's not our priority. Our priorities are to get the antibiotics in his system to help this fight because the longer we wait on antibiotics, the more the bacteria are are going. Um, what are our, our priorities are usually, there's three letters, A, B, C, right? Always get used to doing A, B, C, making sure that those are right before you move on to anything else. So NCLEX testing hint, if something says first or priority, you're going to think A, B, C, okay? So airway, is our airway okay? Our SATs are 95% on room air. My airway and breathing, my respiratory rate's a little high, but it's okay. I'm watching it. Airway breathing, I'm okay with. Circulation, what are we worrying about? The blood pressure. The blood pressure. So we've put on our priority to monitor our blood pressure. Okay? So we've covered our priorities. And monitoring biosigns will keep our eye on our oxygen levels. Okay? So our priorities, ABC-wise, is to keep monitoring. So monitor and get the antibiotics. Those are our priorities. Second, after we give the antibiotics, we're going to monitor for allergies. Good. And third, I want to make sure that we get, like you said on here, whoa, that three got barely big. We want to give them fluids. Why do we want to give them fluids? To keep them hydrated, because remember, our temperature is not going to be able to cool if we don't keep someone hydrated that has an infection. So we're going to give them fluids. Oh, it's underneath, oh, it got underneath the thing. So we're going to give them fluids and, um, and probably, well, well, we'll ask for an order for glucose just to see. And what else are we going to be monitoring? Probably not. We're monitoring the blood pressure. Oh, my gosh, I got rid of it. Go back. Well, I'll go back. It's, it's, it's recorded. Um, the other thing is if he eats, what would you feed if he decides to eat? Something good, like maybe a, a nutrition shake or something like that. He's got a fever. So that's just, you know, I mean, just starting to think. Your patient doesn't look very sick. And he's not very sick, but he could get sick if you forget the antibiotics or the monitoring, okay? Just know what's coming, and that's what those interventions are for. So what would a nursing diagnosis be? Oh, my gosh. Let's take a minute. I am going to use a lot of nursing diagnoses. Ah, I lost my thing. I have them all on a slide. Do you have your dull diagnosis books? If you have them with you, pull them out. If not, I'm going to pull up a slide for you. Ah, where are they? Yeah, you thought you were going to have to do these on care plans. Heh. Not. Come on. Oh, look at these. Look at this beautiful slide. I will have you bring these to clinical. I love nursing diagnoses. Um, Sorry about that. Okay, so they did a great job of kind of separating them all. If you have a NANDA nursing diagnosis book, they're all in there in these ways. So let's look at this because the re why do we need nursing diagnoses? Why do we care? This guides our care. Okay, you've identified a priority for your patient. Your priority is the fever, the antibiotics, the infection, right? Whenever you do a care plan, you had better, sure as heck, have a diagnosis that goes with your priority, okay? My priority isn't ambulating this patient. My priority isn't, you know, um, intake and output. That was down, kind of down at number three. My priority is infection. So what do you think 
if you can see all these on here, would be your nursing diagnosis. Let me see if, why isn't this, whoa. Hang on, I'm trying to work my program. I don't think, there we go, okay. So let's think about where is it? Where is it? Where is it? High risk for altered body temperature. Well, there you go. I have one down here. High risk for altered body temperature. Ineffective thermoregulation. If you're going to give, and if you're giving any antipyretics, aspirin, Motrin, whatever for fever, hey, guess what? You have a diagnosis right there. He's ineffectively thermoregulating. So, and he's at high risk for altered body temperature. That's why you're monitoring him, right? You identified in your head, I have an infection. I need to watch his blood pressure and watch his um, temperature. That goes right under high risk for altered body temperature. Those are interventions for those things. Um, there is also high risk for fluid volume deficits, right? Because this patient is going to leak, right? So he's going to get dehydrated. This is just learning to use the language, okay? You know in your head that a fever is going to make you dehydrated, mess up with your blood pressure, mess with your respiratory rate, um, and you're on antibiotics. So if you're on antibiotics, what else do you have? You also have, gosh, look at all these things we're circling. Altered nutrition intake, da, 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 infection, uh, where are we? I'm looking through some more. Sorry. There's fatigue. There's fatigue. Do you have some that are based on like side effects of antibiotics? Even. Um, yeah. If you do have, if you do start having, um, you can go down and co start coming up with like 18 nursing diagnoses for your patient. Mm -hmm. But what I want you to focus on are your priorities. Your priorities are getting them as antibiotics making sure that they get their temperature under control, making sure that they are thermoregulating okay, making sure they're not getting dehydrated. Um, and then the other ones kind of fall in, in there. If for some reason that respiratory rate starts climbing and you need to put on oxygen because his oxygen saturations went down to 90 and his respiratory rate's 30, now we have a new priority. What was our new priority? Ineffective breathing pattern, altered gas exchange. So we have new priorities. Our priorities change throughout the day. So our priority started out being just get him his antibiotics, make sure the infection doesn't get any worse, monitor blood pressure, temperature, wait, blood cell count, get the culture sent off. But now his respiratory got worse. You move back to ABC, you always move back to ABC. ABC becomes your priority, and now your intervention should be related to that priority. Your intervention should be putting on oxygen, monitoring his lung sounds, all the things that go with gas. So I will kind of be bringing in, don't worry, you're going to get to know them really well by block four because we will always be looking for what is our priority at this time and what interventions go with it. The diagnosis kind of will tell you, if you look up the diagnosis, all the interventions are right there. So if you don't know how to deal with a patient, if you're like, I, I don't even know where to go from here, um, use these diagnoses to help you. And I know that book is big and heavy and, you know, has a lot of stuff in it. Um, you can go anywhere. There's a PDF. If you just look up list of NANDA nursing diagnosis, you can print off a PDF of them. I carry them around in clinical. Um, the problem with it is, is it doesn't have, um, uh, you know, like all the interventions. Like there's not a good way to just get the list and then just interventions. It's like pages and pages and pages. Yeah, it's nice to be able to start thinking to start thinking. And then if you don't know what to do, so I always tell people that your um, care plan is just what the heck did you do for your patient all day, okay? Your interventions are what you did all day in your room. So um, when you have a patient, I want you to identify, and so does NCLEX, and so does HESI. What's my priority? How do I treat my priority? And then the next step is what would be the worst thing that could happen, and how do I avoid that. So what's the worst thing that could happen to this patient right now? Well, yeah. Uh, there, 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 there isn't a nursing diagnosis for, you know, avoiding death. But So if your priority is getting him his antibiotics and making sure he stays hydrated, what's the worst thing that could happen from here? 
allergic reaction would be good. So if you move on to allergic reaction, then, then you need to, so you need to monitor for allergic reaction because that's the worst thing that could happen. So when you're starting to implement interventions, think of the worst thing that could happen and make sure you're watching for that. So that's kind of like the nursing process is just what's my priority? When I take care of that, what's the worst thing that could happen? Kind of like a little flow chart. That's why they call them concept maps and all this stuff. I have a patient. I'm going to do X things. What could happen? Always be ready for the worst. So the worst that can happen is they'll have a drug reaction or this fever is going to get out of control and their blood pressure is going to drop. So you need to monitor for the worst case scenario. Okay. So when you are taking an NCLEX test, if it asks you for priority, it's going to be ABC or what is your important thing for this patient at the time. And then after you do these things, what are you monitoring for? And that's what it is. Worst case scenario, monitor for the worst case scenario. If the worst case scenario never happens, then you can move down your list to all the other things that you have to do. Like make sure that his nutrition is good. Make sure that he's not fatigued. Make sure that he's rest. All those little things. But your priority is antibiotics, fluids. So that's kind of how we're going to do it. We're going to do a couple more with each little thing that we talk about. So take a little 10-minute break, and then we'll go on to this part. So we'll see you back here at 10 till. Okay. So hypersensitivity is just anything where you get an allergic response. Um, how do we know? How do we diagnose it? It's usually a skin test. Have you, has anybody been for an allergic skin test? They're absolutely horrible. There you go to a dermatologist because you're, or not a dermatologist, an allergist because you're sneezing and runny nose and taking Benadryl all the time and not being able to function because you're tired. And they will basically put allergens in your skin and see which ones you react to. Oh my gosh, it itches like a mother. They put it on your forearm or on your back and they basically just poke you with common allergens and see which ones you react to. And then they're like, oh, we can't give you Benadryl. You can't take Benadryl or Zyrtec for like a week before you get this because they don't want the, histo the antihistamine. They want to see the histamine reaction. They want to see what you're oversensitive to. And oh, it's a horrible, horrible test. But imagine if you have a, so they prick you and you are deathly allergic to nuts and they prick you with a nut allergen. What do you think could happen? You could have an anaphylactic reaction. So these skin tests are not always benign depending on how bad your reactions are. Because remember, type ones could be anywhere from sneezing to full on anaphylaxis. Um, we don't know. So anyway, the skin test is, they will put allergens in your skin and see what, you, um, what you're allergic to. And they, it's always something where if you, anyone can put in the pricks, but they still need um, someone at the bedside in case of, a, of an anaphylactic reaction to one of these things. The other thing they can do is draw blood and see if you have antibodies to these allergens. Um, and if you have a whole lot of, um, of antibodies to these allergens, you've probably been having a lot, a lot of reactions to them, so they can do a blood test as well. What do we care, nursing-wise, about allergies? Well, if you have allergies, I just love, I love this. <laughs> He's like crying, holding the cat. <laughs> um, um, that's my daughter. She's allergic to cats, but she loves cats. And she's like, that's okay, I'll just take a bed. <laughs> um, so don't touch your allergens. If you're allergic to cat dander, if you're allergic to nuts, don't touch them. Um, and if you do, um, you can develop anaphylaxis at any time. Um, you can have a progressive reaction. They do blood tests to tell you whether your reaction will become anaphylactic at any point. Um, um, I'm also allergic to uh, some kind of bee. I don't know. I reached up in my head and touched something that stung me. Whole arm swelled up to my neck from a finger sting. Um, and they did a whole bunch of tests and said, oh, well, yes, it's a severe localized reaction, but it'll never become anaphylactic. I don't know how they told that from a test, but they did, so I don't carry an EpiPen. But it's always a little worry in the back of my mind if I touch something. I don't know if it was a wasp, a bee, or a yellow jacket, or whatever it was. But just know, and then they need to be taking antihistamines to help to quell down. It's just a hypersensitivity. It's the immune system seeing something and attacking it with full force, and it didn't really need to. It's just a little... A little too much um, allergy. Um, if your patient undergoes skin or scratch testing, if you're working in an allergist office or anything like that, make sure you're watching for anaphylaxis. And then you can get injections. Um, 
to sensitize yourself so that basically your body gets used to seeing it and stops overreacting. Um, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I will let you read antihistamines. Probably all of you have taken an antihistamine before in your life. Um, there's just some more common ones over there. Um, you've probably seen every single one of the over-the-counter ones, Zyrtec, Benadryl, Allegra, Claritin. Those are all the over-the-counters. Um, there are some prescription ones as well. Um, but they all do the same thing. They make you drowsy. They make you dry. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. You've all had antihistamines. Um, latex allergy, you've probably seen if you go into the hospital, people get really kind of, um, they ask about latex allergies. Um, there are two kinds of latex allergies. And again, you don't need to know that there are two kinds or whatever. Just know that if you, um, if your patient has had multiple surgeries, frequent hospitalization, or you guys as healthcare workers, the more you're exposed to it, if you already have kind of a reaction to it, you're going to be exposed to it a lot more, and so you're at higher risk for a latex allergy because you keep getting you keep getting shown latex and your body starts being freaking out about it. Um, and then these are latex similar foods. So if your patient has an allergy to bananas, avocados, chestnuts, tomatoes, you know, blah blah, blah they are probably at very high risk for having latex allergy as well. So you want to make sure they get latex free items. Um, so if your patient comes to you with a list of allergies a mile long, you're probably going to ask them about latex or avoid latex items on someone who has a huge allergic history because they're at high risk for having latex allergy. And the last thing we want them is to have an allergic site because we put tape on them or, you know, things like that. So a lot of stuff in the hospital, they're trying to get away from latex, but because we are going to be in the hospital a lot more, um, just be aware that people with a lot of allergies have latex allergies. So allergies themselves, we just treat symptomatically with histamines, antihistamines, okay? Um, anaphylaxis is the most acute um, hypersensitivity reaction. You are super sensitive to the point that you could lose consciousness, drop your blood pressure severely, get short of breath, get a skin rash, get lightheaded. Basically, you pass out and die from anaphylaxis. So we want to avoid it, but sometimes we don't know that you are allergic to something until we give it to you. And then we're like, ooh, well, you're not getting that again. So how do we know if it's allergy or anaphylaxis? Well, you can have all the allergy symptoms with anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is basically a systemic hypersensitivity, okay? So why do you think you see all these symptoms. So why would you lose consciousness? Your blood pressure drops out to the point where you're not getting blood pressure to your brain. 